Hello, everyone. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Lee White. I'm Anthony Wheeler. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. We've worked for all the major publishers in the business. Together, we publish somewhere around 75 children's books, and we've all taught illustration at university art programs. Each week, we tackle the subject related to illustration from three perspectives. Sometimes we argue, sometimes we agree, but every time you learn something new about Lee going to jail. Brand spanking say, new. It was supposed I, to be brand spanking It's not in the script. Could, it's not in the script. You could also see, that's, say... That's why I get paid more than Will and Jake. You could also say oh, sometimes we squirrel out. I improvise. <laughs> I improvise. Wait, do I get paid? Uh, oh, shh, shh, shh. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, no there is no, an no, elephant no. in the room. Uh, the illustrious uh, Jake Parker is gone today. He's on assignment. Uh, I did get word he is in Peru. He's harvesting the ink from these ink spiders uh, that he can bring back for Inktober 2024. So don't have That's fear. Right. He That's will right. Well, be he, ha- he has been bitten. Uh, I think there's an antidote close by. Um, yeah. So he should be. He should be good to go. You should be good. All right, so let's dive in. We're doing, uh, this is episode 180. Can you believe we've done 180 of these things? Um, all right, so we're going to be doing listener questions today. Um, so let me see. Oh, this, of course, he throws us a little curveball. It says, so I, so I can help you with this one really easily. Oh, go ahead, please. Yeah, so here, I'm going to switch scenes. So if you're watching the YouTube video, uh, I am switching things up. I'm pressing this, buttons. This is going to be an interactive clip moment here. Well, you need to share your screen there, buddy. I am. Look at it. <laughs> Look at my screen. Yeah, but the, it's still just the three of us up there. When you share your screen, it should just be you big yeah. and then us little. You, you're well, not, I don't know how to do No, no, no. Look at my look at my, my monitor. Look at no, my... I see that. But within Zoom, you have to press share screen there, buddy. Oh God, this yeah. is exhausting. It's, it's just it is impossible it's working with these people. There he is. There is it, he is. Is it the way it needs to look? Yes, it, it, is. Does, it is. It is now. So for it those of you guys way. who want to see what we're seeing, you can go to YouTube. We are broadcasting this sucker um, so you can watch what we're doing. Uh, Anthony has pulled up an Instagram account. Uh, take it away, Anthony. Can you hear this? Um, no. No. <laughs> it worked in my normal method, but you screwed things up. <laughs> okay, we're pausing re- this. We're pausing this right now. It works in the normal method, Lee, but you made me change things, bro. This, this right. is don't this worry, is Daniel the might multiverse. even edit this out. You never. How know. about how about this? Let's all let's all just pause for a second, and then uh, and then let's Daniel can t- incorporate the video into the edit. How does that sound? If you can get it to him, yeah, I can get it to him. And we're going to, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. I'm going to show you how to write a kid's book with less than 100 words, sell it on Amazon without printing anything, and make passive income for years to come. First, go on over to Amazon.com and click these three lines up in the top left-hand corner. Scroll down to Kindle e-readers and books, click that, and then click on Kindle Books. Then go up to Categories and click on Children's eBooks. Then take a look at the books and get some inspiration. Here you can see one that's selling for $3.99, one for $11.99, and one for $4.99, and get some inspiration to write your own book. Then you're going to pick a title and write a story. Mine is about my cat Garfield, and bonus points if you can make it rhyme. Next, head on over to Fiverr, and in the search bar, type Kids Book Illustration. Then you can apply a filter and view all of the artists that are willing to illustrate your kids' book for only $5. Finally, you're going to go to kdp.amazon.com and it will walk you through the process of self publishing your ebook. Want even easier ways to make money online? Go ahead and hit the plus sign and I'll show you some more. Uh, here, let me read, let me read this question though, because I think, uh, I think this is, it, it, now that Daniel has played the video, thank you, Daniel. Um, so this question comes from Christian who reached out over on Instagram uh, and says, this guy and others like him are filling the market with low quality products by using bottom of the barrel art from starving artists. I've seen several videos like this incorporating AI or drag and drop stickers or even emojis. What are some of the actions a starting illustrator can do in the face of such a saturated market Gents, what do you think? Um, I can you explain the video real quick? Because I mean, you, uh, Daniel's edited it in, but I haven't seen the video. <laughs> you haven't seen the video. <laughs> we haven't seen it. <laughs> Where have you guys been? We got this email last night from Jake. 
Oh, I didn't know this is that we've never 180 episodes. We've never had to watch something. We've never had to watch something. I had not, it all not, queued up, but you made me not change. A, not, a, not a video. All right. What's the gist of it? All right. So the uh, so the the gist of this video is there's this uh, this guy on on the internet and says, "Hey kids, do you want to make extra money from selling your children's books on the internet?" And he shows this entire process about how you could write like an AI generated script or hire an artist from Fiverr and how you can use Kindle Direct and publish to the Kindle, and uh, and it's it's. It's typically, and, the, and these kind of videos are all over the place, um, but it's the idea that you can skirt the system of years of work and years of practice and years of building an audience and instantaneously make money from a thing. Uh, and, that's, and that's what this is. And then, and then you stretch that whole thing out where you have people who, who do this. And he talks about how easy it is. How and easy how it is seamless, and how simple yeah. it, it is and how you can do this quickly and efficiently and effectively with no friction whatsoever. Right. You're just selling books on Amazon. You're doing this and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, you're just making six figures, whereas yesterday you were making nothing. Yeah. No figures. Okay, so, so how does somebody avoid this? Um, should they... Should they? My question is a little bit different, is should we even worry about this? Because anybody who goes through it will realize it doesn't work that way. Content has to be... We create good content, and it's hard to get out there, much less garbage, right? Yeah. Do you guys agree or disagree? Um, I, I have a whole answer for this. So you just keep going. You'll be wrong and then I'll correct you. I don't, think I'm, I don't think I'm wrong. <laughs> I, st- I don't think I just, I'm wrong. I stated my case. I don't Go think ahead. I'm wrong. So, so here, here are my notes. Cause again, I prepared for this episode, even though you guys derailed me. <laughs> what a new earlier. <laughs> he prepared. We did. Yeah. Uh, my, my thing is grifters are going to grift. People who want to take the easy way out are going to take the easy way out. But there's also a whole section of content creators, people people who just aggregate information and make these videos, so you will click on them, so you will then worry about them. <clears throat> a lot of this doesn't exist. A lot of this doesn't exist. Does it exist in maybe a tiny little pocket on the internet? Sure. Do we worry about it? No, not at all. Um, I think there's always going to be people who are going to game the system. But I, I think you have to worry about them very minimally. And this is, if you would listen to this episode in 2027, which, first of all, go outside, do, go do something different. But uh, I think things could potentially change down the road as systems and things get built for people. I guess m- my perspective is, like Lee said, it is hard to get your message out to people in the first place as a very good maker of stuff, stories, images, whatever it's going to be. But beyond that, these guys, these grifters, these people who are trying to game the system, it, the idea is that there's over a hundred, how many, like how big do you think the United States is? Like what do you think the U.S. population is? It's close to 400 million. It's like yeah. something. Yeah. yeah, and a few years ago it was 330 million. You don't need uh, to sell to every single individual here in the United States or whatever country you live in. You need to be able to project what you do out to at a minimum between 500 and 1,000 fans. We've heard that, you know, you need 1,000 true fans. Somebody who's going to spend $100 with you as a true fan one time a year, and that brings your projected revenue into to six figures, right? These, these guys, they, again, who's going to buy this stuff? There's no heart. There's no energy. There's no marketing. There's no relationship with an audience. Um, it's just fodder. It's just stuff that gets put out there. And so the my wrap up to, to my answer here is this person said, what is a what does a beginning illustrator do to combat stuff like this? You tell your story, you look directly at the camera, you make high quality stuff, you're empathetic, you're a kind human, you help people wherever you can, and you tr- you try to provide a product that that fills a gap or a need for somebody. That's probably a good place to start. Boom. Boom. That's right. Let me let me say this. There's some good news on the AI front for for illustrators who are worried about this. And and one of those things is that uh, Amazon has been sending around um, to people with KDP accounts. That's the Kindle Direct Publishing um, letters and and basically policy saying, hey, if you're not allowed to use AI generated art and text. If you do and we catch you, we're going to cancel your account. 
So there's been a lot of people scrambling because that's what that's there's all these class courses online right now on like how to use AI to make content books, right? Yeah. And, and uh, ha- but basically, like you say, skirt the system. Having said that, I'll say this: when Photoshop came out, and and um, artists were able to start using Photoshop, it cut their time down dramatically, and the people who were working traditionally felt like they the the digital people were cheating right so for 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 the first part of the digital art revolution that i was a part of and i wasn't working digitally i felt that way i i've like I'm like these these people are doing what i what takes me a day they're doing in an hour or two and that's just not fair um and you know they're just using technology to to skirt the system or to cheat and now we feel that way about AI. I think that there will be people who use AI generated content that will change it and tweak it enough that Amazon, you, the consumer won't know. They'll do it in a really smart way. It'll cut their time down tremendously. Um, and some of them will do will create really good content using AI. Um, and and they, they will create something that people want. Most will not. Most, most, you know, 99 out of 100 will not be able to do that because it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of um, creativity and a lot of savvy to find a niche market that you can create something in that people really, really want. And if you think about yourself, like why you buy the things you buy and if you've ever bought anything off of an Amazon ad or I'm sorry, Facebook ad or YouTube ad or Google ad or something. And I look around and there's a bunch of things that I've bought or that I've almost bought, right? And they're, they're either things that when I saw them, I was like, oh, that's cool. Oh, I really need that. Or, or maybe it's not something I need, but it's something that would be really cool as a gift. And so I have a list of things that I've bought. They are, they're creative. They're things that, you know, and so... And so that's what you have to do, whether you use AI and hide it or not. And and I'm not making a moral judgment here because I know that a lot of people have a moral judgment against using AI. The fact is there will be people who are smart, who use AI and you won't know because they won't use the the AI render. They'll use it to, um, to, to get a start for their drawings. We, Lee and I both know someone who, who, who's getting good at that. Um, but is that, and then they they redraw it, and then it's in their style, and you can't tell. But, but that you know, I was having I was having a conversation with a friend about that exact thing. How many mm-hmm. of us go look at? Uh, and I think we're deviating to a different portion of things. But how many of us mm-hmm. do use Pinterest or three D models that the internet somebody has already generated anyway to figure out an angle on a thing, or to figure out a color scheme, or to get a to to get a good sort of perspective build on something. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, character design in the in the TV and film industry is just photo bashing after photo bashing right. after photo bashing. Uh, these are these are tools that people have cobbled together, and and you know AI done ethically. In those kind of ways, where you can build sort of that that under that underwire of your thing that you can mm-hmm. then build over top of, and as long as you're shifting and morphing and changing and making it a trillion times better and putting your personality and your story and your mm-hmm. utility into it, that, that's a yeah, that's a different. that's a great point. I mean, like if you think about it, like someone who's using reference, which we all do, right? Yeah, we don't we don't put a footnote at the bottom of our piece of art going, well, I looked at this image. I looked at that image. I, <laughs> I got this angle from here. I, I mean, we're inspired by things and, and, but those same people will say that it's morally wrong to use AI in any way, shape or form. And I, I don't know. I, I think that um, we're influenced by each other anyway. And the computer is basically taking our work and making some, making an amalgam of, of some, some sort. And then, if we're using that as reference or as um, as inspiration, I don't see it much different than looking at a bunch of Pinterest uh, yeah. images. No, and there's been a version of AI for a little while. If you think about it, and I don't know if you guys do this in your images because you're not, I think, as experimental sort of as I, as I am in, in making my work, but sometimes I'll have a portion of an image drawn or painted. I'll select it with the lasso tool, and then I, I would autofill that area just to see what Photoshop would do. 
and then it would it populates it and then sometimes it would be something that I would never do it doesn't add something different you know what I mean mm-hmm. like AI does now it doesn't add like oh a stagecoach and then all of a sudden a stagecoach appears but it's making content based on what else is in the image and uh but I didn't make that. Like all of a sudden it'll suggest a composition, say for example, or an alternate contrast level or something like that. And I'll be like, oh, that's interesting. And I'll start to build on top of that. Now, was that cheating? I mean, it's sort of the same thing. Um, and so I, I, don't, I think it's, I think you're totally right. It's just a logical extension of what we've already been doing. Yeah. If, you do it, if you do it ethically and you're paying attention. It's, the, it's what Anthony's original question was talking about that's the weird part is that people with no editing ability, no artistic ability, can come up with something that's brand, mm-hmm. brand spanking new. So but, you know, it's weird. I, I was rereading the question here too and, and Christian is talking about you know, a, a saturated market of things like stickers and pins and doodads and stories and books and things like that. The reality is, it's been a set. There's been a saturated market for that stuff for a very long time, and I think our eyes are a little bit more open to it because there's a lot of people making content about it today. <clears throat> you go to a comic con or an art festival or spend any time on the internet in the last couple of years, people people just have stuff. They make stuff. Big companies out of China are flooding markets with things. I don't buy a lot of that stuff. What I do is I buy the things from people who I really, really like, who tell that good story and things like that. And I think that's how you transcend, uh, you know, just endless amounts of doodads and, you know, things on the market. Yeah, so. you've, you've got to, you, you've got to create something. Like, I think that AI art, it, it, I mean, I hate to say this, but I think that in the, the next five or 10 years, maybe even less than that, there will be people that are able to do to to illustrate with just using AI and and tweaking it a little bit and um, but what they can't do is is they can't come up with the same ideas that you do, you know. Right. And so, also so it's really the, about this. Yeah. It's about the product that you make. It's not about illust- It won't will be less about illustrating for someone else and more about the thing that you yeah. the dream project that you want to work on. Yeah. There's a stick to it of this component to it, too. Like we do this because this is how we support our families and it's the dream and and everything. Uh, You know, I left corporate America just to draw weird pictures of pigs and flying saucers. Um, A lot of people think that's the dream, but the reality is that it's just it's really hard to do what we do sometimes. And you have to really stick with the thing. Um, And I have to feel like in the next five or 10 years that people are going to use that that generated thing for their passion project, their passion project is going to be so specific to them and to their kid and to their pet. Um, And they'll feel like they're able to create that, but that's not going to stop them from buying a really great quality thing that speaks to them in a different way. Um, you just got to be better. You just got to continue to get better and upgrade every single year. Well, and that can I be do, a little scary. I, I do think that it's going to push the content in an interesting way because generic content is not going to sell anymore because there's too many people making stuff. And the, it's just going to fall like this, like this uh, person asking the question is worried about. It's so much just boring, middle of the road content that you're going to need to be more niche. And I, and I wonder what's going to happen to mainstream publishing because they need to uh, sort of appeal to a general audience in order to sell enough books. And I don't necessarily know if that's the audience that I want anymore. I'd rather, I'd rather appeal to a smaller group who's fanatical about some weird thing I'm making versus like, uh, you know, Timmy eats a cookie, you know, these like boring kind of children's book ideas (laughs) that, uh, (laughs) That uh, that really nobody cares about. They re- yeah. you read them and then you forget about them, and that's not the book I want to make. Um, even if you know a million copies sell, well, maybe if a million, but um, if a lot of <laughs> copies sell, you know, I would hate to be to use our analogy. We've used music as an analogy quite a bit lately on here. Uh, you know, I would hate to be. It's going to date me severely, but like the, the like like the Backstreet Boys were back in our day or something like that. Just super boring, bland, but extremely popular work i mean is that the work anybody wants to make i just don't think i think pretty soon unless you make something unique it's going to just get passed by and uh and that's going to be our charge now is like what do you really care about as an individual person is going to be highlighted and you're going to have to know it a little more it's going to actually force the artist to do more work internally 
and mm-hmm. say, what kind of stories am I going to make that stand out from all this noise? Yeah. Um, so. And, I, and I'll always say, I don't think you need a massive audience, like a huge social media. You need to cater. You need to have a, a, a really cool thing that you do all the time, and you cater to a group of people who think that is really cool, who empathize with you. And whether that's that 500 follower or the 500 true fans or the 1,000 or maybe a couple thousand, to make a really good living, you don't need a ton more. If you have a ton more, go for it. Let's go. But I don't know if you need a ton more than right. that. And that's how you can cater. Yeah. All right, let's move on from this question. We're beating, beating this dead horse. Hey, I did want to do a little update on a previous episode. We, we've been talking about artist scams, and I got a good one. Good one, the where I'm scamming people. No, I'm just kidding. Where I, <laughs> I, I, was, I was suckered in to a, or not suckered in, but I was kind of lured into a really interesting scam this past week, and I wanted to sort of follow it to its logical conclusion. Like a lot of red flags came up, but it's interesting because I'm really, I, I feel like I'm pretty well versed in the field of illustration and, and how client interactions and things like that. And even I was like, is this real or not real? And I thought it was really interesting, so I thought Tell I'd share it. it. Um, so I get an email asking if I am interested in working with an ad agency. And, uh, of course I'm always interested in working with an ad agency because that's where a lot of the money is. And so the ad, I, you, of course, the first thing you do is Google the person, Google the agency. Well, agencies here in Denver person is the hiring manager at this agency in Denver, huge advertising agency, multiple locations around the world. I don't know if they just got lucky. Uh, that I happen to live in one of the places where they have an agency. But um, they wanted to, they were looking really for an art director. And I said, I'm not interested in that, but I've got, I have been offered positions like that before too, um, legit. And, um, and so I explained that I'm not interested in that, but I am interested in being a freelancer. If they have a pool of freelancers, I'd just be included on that. And they said, great, uh, we want to interview you, and talk, which makes perfect sense. And so I'm like, okay, that's cool. But when I sent the response that I'm not interested in the art director position, I'm interested in the illustrator position, uh, it was sort of a generic sounding email that came back. It says, sounds great. Uh, When would you be available for an interview? And, uh, (laughs) and, And then it said, can you chat now? And it was a Skype address. Strangely enough, and I was like, that was a huge red flag. Mm. Any organization, and this is just through researching it since then, any organization is going to go through a more private channel than just this general Skype thing. It's not who's used Skype anyway in the last like five years. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I sent a message back that said, no, I can't chat right now, but I can, I can chat. You know, I, I said I can, I'm available like, you know, Monday at 10 or whatever. And then the, I got an email response. Great. Sounds good. Can you chat right now? Oh no. <laughs> that was the same email. So I was like, that's kind of weird, but I, but I was, and then so the, all the red flags are going up at this point, but I'm like, I'm going to follow this through. So I told them when I was available and then I log in to this um Skype address that they gave me and it was it was, you know, the name of the person and the agency and all that stuff looked totally legit. And start chatting with them, and they said, oh, cool, you're ready for the, the interview. Well, since we're going to be passing this off to a team, this is what they're typing. We're going to pass this off to a team. Uh, we're going to do a, uh, the interview over text and not video. And mm-hmm. it, I just thought that was, I've just never heard of that. I'm not opposed to that, and I could see the way they said it made it sound, well, you know, I can I can understand that. But while I was chatting with them, I Google Skype interview scam, you know, or something like that. And, and it came up, oh, they're going to divert you to text. They're going to start fishing for private information. Mm. And so I said, I'm okay doing a text interview, but before I do that, I want you to call me from a local number or do a private chat. I can send you the Zoom link um, and just so I can verify your identity. And then it was just silence after that. They it's bailed, gone. of course. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. they know I was on to them. Um, but I just thought it was it was clever enough, and 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 you know, just looked legit enough that I wanted to pass it on to people because, like, yeah. if I was that close to it, like somebody like like my mom or somebody or my brother who's not as tech savvy, and they would have fallen for that in a second. Yep. Yep. As an old executive recruiter, one of the things that that uh, we used to talk about and we do quite a bit. Because when, when those emails come through, you look at that email really closely 
because right. that a lot of times they're going to spoof that person's name or put some extra, like a comma or an extra M on something. And you need to, first of all, verify that email. And then there are multiple verify email tools on the internet. Uh, a lot of times what I can do like, um, is, is call into the organization and say, can you verify this email for me and, and have them read it back to you, have somebody in, in right, you know, right. the administrative assistant pool. It's a, it's a really good place to start. A lot of times what I'll do is I will, um, I'll get that initial e- email and then I will stop that thread and I'll send them an email on a separate thread uh, to what the email is supposed to be. Gotcha. Uh, and a lot of times what that will do is it'll go back to the real person they're trying to spoof, not necessarily the, you know, the fake group that is spoofing it. So, yeah, you got to be super diligent, though. Uh, one, jo- one job that I got um, this last what, year, year and a half ago, uh, I got the email that I received felt like a felt like a phishing scam. <laughs> And so I slow played it for a couple of days and I responded on a different channel. And it turned out it was a legit job and I made a lot of money from it. Uh, but I was just so tense about, you know, getting, you know, uh, getting one pulled over on me that I put a lot of layers of security in between me and them. And, and, and never anybody who's in a legit position would understand you doing that, yep. too. Yeah, it's just too, too sketch um, no. these days. So be careful. Why are we talking there. about this? It was just an update because we had talked about scams that are going out to illustrators. And oh, this could okay. be something that, you know, public service announcement. That's what I'm I like. How, that's what I, I like how Will about. just got here. <laughs> yeah, hey, hey, man, welcome. Wait, uh, so uh, this wait, is uh, why is Zoom three, on right now. Three, what are we three, doing? Three, <laughs> three point perspective. <laughs> Will's looking oh. at orders coming in. <laughs> it's like, doesn't everybody know about these scams? Who are, no, they don't. No, I mean, they, they they're change different. Rapidly, and they, man. Yeah, they change. Okay. I hadn't seen this. I, one. I got like, the. Uh, the the one where they want to give me a check ahead of time for yeah. more and for more than yeah uh, you're like six I'm years behind for. there buddy you're gonna you're no, gonna I'm be talking I, in, in two weeks I, about I, the no, guy I'm saying I got with one the of those hearing the other problem day. who's <laughs> wanting to hire every, everyone <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I get like ten of those a week and, I can't uh, believe well, they're still sending those yeah we should it, it, it's got to be working because yeah we should do an episode we have a uh, I I've got a super fun Discord uh, for my live streaming stuff and and all of that and we have a whole uh, thread or channel uh, based on community scams. And so uh, anybody and everybody puts, you know, anytime they think something suspect, they put it in there and we can all review it. We should have an episode where we oh, review fun. the top five uh, art scams that are going around right now. And then uh, then people can be vigilant and uh, and keep track. Mm. I love that. I love yeah, it. That'll be episode 193. Done deal. Done cool. deal. All right, let's move on. This is... Uh, our next little question. First name Haven. Haven. Can we use your name on the air? I'm glad I read her name first and then, and then get a yes on that <laughs> next question. Um, the subject is, I promise this is a great question. You're going to be really proud of me. Hey, Anthony, Lee, and Will. How did they know Anthony is going to be here? Um, I really enjoy the podcast. In the 10 Art School Signs episode and others, you've talked about the students that promise to do great work and then can't deliver because they have a history of not putting in effort. My question is, since you know this is a red flag, have you ever interviewed intervened early and if so how for example did you try walking the student through the project in smaller steps or do a progress check before the submission date is the common issue that they aren't creating any work or that their work does not meet the demands of the assignment i'm hoping to teach in some capacity in the future and it would be really valuable to have some Mm. of these techniques to support my students my theory is that the first step to reaching and replicating success is learning the underlying process that result in successful um, products and, and illustrations, I guess. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, I we always intervene. I'm assuming Will does, but I'm just going to speak for all of us. Uh, it's and when you're teaching in the classroom, if you're a good teacher, there are steps that need to be done. It's not just hey, here's an illustration assignment, and then in two weeks, just show me this beautiful illustration. There are steps along the way where you definitely got to dive in, at least in my classes. And I have a grading rubric where each part of the process is graded, not the finish by itself. The finish only is actually the smallest part of mine. It's really the buildup of steps. And so you can see really early when somebody's starting to leave the steps behind. And that's typically what I see from these uh, talented students that don't want to put in the effort is it's just a minimal amount on the front end of work, meaning the mm-hmm. thumbnail sketches are either weak or non-existent. They, it, 
the bigger sign though for me is that they do the initial step of work and then they do not change it because they have a false high uh, a false sense of their ability and how good the first step was mm, that's a big so, problem yeah yeah what about you guys i um i used to think that i made a difference as a teacher <laughs> Uh, Daniel, can you insert <laughs> violin music? In the background the I used to think I mattered. <laughs> you know, it, here's what here's what I learned. I, I I taught for a total of eleven years, and uh, in you know in, in uh, university um, illustration programs, and I um, I thought that I could that there was something that I needed to do to inspire those kinds of students that weren't working. So this is not, I want to be very clear what I was talking about in that episode was it's not, it's not students that, that turn in bad work. It's students that go MIA that just don't turn in anything. Right. Or, or it's obvious that they uh, did it the night before because, Oh, it's due and I better turn in something. Um, and, and so I used to think that I, if I broke it down further, if I, if there was something else that I did, and what I've come to realize is there are students that love to draw. This is college. This isn't junior high or high school. This isn't, to me, it's, it's someone who doesn't like to draw or paint, got into a program for drawing and painting. The, the students who love it, they, they are turning in tons of work. They're redoing work on their own. They're, um, you can't stop them. They're working on projects outside of class assignments. They're, some, some of them are doing their own comics. They're off to the races. It's not a right. motivational, it's, it is a motivational problem, but it's on their end. Um, and I don't believe that there's anything that the teacher can do to motivate them. I don't believe that's the teacher's job either. I think that in college, uh, that's true in, in college, agree. by the time you're there, this is what you're going to do for life. And this is what you love. And, and I, I liken it to this. Look at this. Look at the kids who come in on scholarship for sports. You know, they, they come in on scholarship because they are, they are working so hard in their football, basketball, baseball, tennis, whatever it is program because they love it. And I, 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 and I, I would give this speech to my students and say, look, you really need to love this because there's no way you're going to make it and get a job doing this if you're half in, half out, kind of thinking, well, I might, this might be something that I want to do. Um, there's nothing wrong with discovering that it's not for you along the way. And I would tell students, you know, you count yourself lucky if you are in my class or someone else's class and you learn that this isn't what you want to do that's a that's good news for you but um but no like the, i don't i don't think there's anything that can be done in fact i would talk about some of these students to other teachers and say hey what did what did so and so did they do anything in your class and what do you think and and it's almost always the same thing it's like they're just for whatever reason, they're not turning in any work. Yeah. I mean, that's actually interesting because what you're saying is true. Why? I mean, if, are we really responsible for beating them into submission and, and doing more work? I mean, you can't, you can't, and you, you just can't, you would spend all your time trying to, to do that and it wouldn't produce any fruit. It's true. It's, it's, it's true. And then, and even if you did motivate them for the short term, they would lose it once, once, you know, they go to with another class and they leave you behind. Um, that's interesting. Uh, having said that, I will say this, that if I had students that were struggling and they came in with some work, um, I would spend a lot of time helping them and working and, and, and going, this is great. You know, I, I see what you're trying to do here. Let me help you Right. Fix that, right. you know, and yeah. I had some students that went from towards the bottom of the class toward to the top because and 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 some not even in my class like later on. And, um, you know, I thought they weren't listening. I thought they weren't doing anything in school. And then all of a sudden, years later there, I see their work and it's like, what happened to you? You know, and and, and their story would be something like, you know. I just decided that this is what I really want. And you know, they were just a, more of a late bloomer. They just finally decided, 
I better start working. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can, so you can spot the students a lot, you know, a little bit of talent and, and a lot of interest goes a long way. Uh, and, and, and a desire to work. I mean, a lot of times with students and now since I've left traditional teaching behind and since we've been doing SVS and stuff, I get these emails. Hey, I'm interested in being a children's book illustrator. Can we meet for coffee? And, you know, I ask you some questions. I get that question, that email mm-hmm. quite a bit. And my response um, now is show me all the work that you've done so I know where you are. Tell me where the specific questions that you have about the industry. And it turns out most of these people have done nothing. Right. And that's what I was doing in the classroom too. I would say, they would say, Hey, I'm struggling with this. And I say, show me your struggle. Show me all the sketches that you did that you're talking about struggling. I can't draw hands. Well, show me all the hand drawings you've tried to do. I'm not just going to say, Oh, here's the trick. Right. You know what I mean? And the, that's how I would weed out the, the good students versus the bad. Cause they could show me that struggle. Hey, I'm trying to find, uh, the right agent for me. Here's the here's the spreadsheet I put together. Can you <laughs> yeah. show me that? We'll talk all day. Yep, yep. I don't have traditional teaching experience like you guys do, but Can tell. the antithesis. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> to to something that Will said. When I was in high school, I was a I was a pretty bright kid, but I didn't. Uh, towards the end of high school, I did not put in the effort that matched my level of brightness. And I was very thankful that I had one teacher who intervened, who knew, who knew I, there was so much more going on uh, that I could have, uh, I could have really, I needed some help. I could have gotten way better. And uh, he gave me some ultra, ultra tough love. And in the moment, I was really angry about it. But man, that intervention, that one simple intervention set me off and uh, I had an ultra successful college career and et cetera, et cetera. But without that, I probably would have been a lazy POS for <laughs> for a while. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you can make a difference. Sometimes. Yeah. No, you, you absolutely can. And the, the benefit of having an experienced teacher is that you can some, I mean, one of my quick sketch, cl- the class I taught is for 10th graders called quick sketch. So interesting because we'd start out with basic lines and I could tell from those basic lines, yeah. even somebody who didn't have a lot of experience who had sort of a potential. And some of these kids like, Oh, I can't draw. I don't have classical, a classical look to my work. I'd pull them aside and it's like, you got something here. There's something here. And they would say, you know, it's clumsy and it's un, unrefined, but you know, you could spot those people pretty early uh, after teaching classes for a number of years. And that's what I'm going back to. Like you get an experienced teacher who can spot that rough kind of diamond in the rough kind of thing. And uh, it goes a long way just to pull them aside and say, Hey, you may not be where the other kids are yet, but you got something that's better than what they've got. Yep. You don't know it yet though. You know? Yeah. I, I'm, and I'm being overly, you know, exaggerating that we don't, that we don't, um, you know, that we don't make a difference. I know that I've made a difference in a lot of students' um, work, but again, it's the peop- it's the ones that at least showed up and and tried. And some some of them were the worst. I was one of the worst in my class, right? So I really appreciated the time and attention that the teacher gave to me. I guess what I'm thinking of is there are students that students that that were MIA the whole semester that didn't turn in anything that didn't ever show me any sketches, so there was nothing for me to help them with. Right. right, and I and want then someone. It's luck of the draw. I'm I like, want you to take a, a, at least one step towards me before I'm going to take a step towards you. Yeah, you know? I mean, it's sort like of I it's can't. sort of a partnership if you think about it. The, like a lot of times, the teacher-student relationship is looked at as a uh, you know one person in power and the other, per- and you're just sort of demanding things. But I think it really is more of a partnership, like you're talking about, Will, where it's yeah. it's you know fifty-fifty, you know. Yeah, and I was very open with with my students about that. And I, unfortunately, you know, you 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 become a more seasoned teacher, the more you go. So probably I feel like I did my best teaching in the last two or three years that I was teaching there. And I would just be very honest with them and say, "Look, I can't help you unless you bring, unless you're showing up to class and bringing sketches, bringing the work that you've done on your own time, and then we'll look at it and we'll work on it together. If you don't bring me anything," You're paying for this, and you're not going to be getting any benefit out of it because I'm not going to hunt you down and seek you out. If you don't turn in anything, I'm you, you can you can hide in here and do nothing, and you know and you'll yeah you get. The, you know, I'm not going to ever so be mad at you. I'm not going to. So you know how, how I eliminated that, eliminated that at the end because I got so sick of students not some students not doing anything or whatever 
that I was look. my son was in karate. Um, and I started looking at the, at the belt system. Like you, if, if the karate school is good, you do not get the next belt. If you can't do, dun, dun, you know, five or six things that are on mm-hmm. that list. Right. And do them to a certain proficiency. And so by the end, and so this might be a note for future teachers out there. I found great success in each of the assignments that I would give. You had to have an A or a B level to move on to the next assignment. So some students would only do one assignment the entire year. They would just keep doing it over and over. <laughs> but they got so much out of that because we could identify where I, they didn't do a D level project over and over for each assignment, you know what I mean? And so I graded on how far, how many assignments they got done, not necessarily, and the effort that they were putting in based on their own ability versus letting somebody just take D's and F's the whole time and not, and just, you know, be in that low bar. And, uh, and the students loved it too. They knew that there's no way they could skate. They were not going to go to the next assignment if it was a C or lower. Mm-hmm. It was interesting. It was it was a fun fun thing to do. I think they liked it. I even had a belt system with a stamp. So if you got through, you get a, this stamp, and then they start. They're just like Karate Kids, going through the belt system. They want the next stamp. So you, you hit know? them with the belt, and then you stamp them. Yes, I had a, a little charger, <laughs> little stun gun. <laughs> Why did you have to bring that into it? It's, it's you not took up my to dumb joke and you elevated it and you made it weird. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Speaking of dumb. Um, (laughs) Can we use your name on the air? Yes, this is from Rachel Kim. Um, Subject, emails are not my friend. It says, hey, Will, Lee, and Anthony. Hope you are well. Thank you for sharing all your knowledge and guidance on the podcast. It's been really helpful for me in my art journey, especially when it comes to wording emails. Recently, I started applying your advice and reaching out to publishers and art directors in search of freelance work. I've received some positive reception, but I haven't received any job offers yet. Yeah, a lot of people are in that boat. Um, it, It is always something along the lines of love your work. Let's keep in touch. Maybe this is common sense, but I don't know what the email etiquette is at this stage and how to turn the keep in touch into a job. Uh, do I re- not reply and wait for them to send me work? Definitely, that's don't do that. Um, am I supposed to say something back to them and schedule a meeting? Don't do that either. Uh, I don't really know how this stage works, and I'm afraid of making the wrong move. This is a great question. Mm-hmm. Thanks for that one, yeah. Rachel. Um, okay, so the keep in touch one is literally exactly what it means. It, it means keep in touch. You know, the, the scheduling, the meeting is way too premature. And then the waiting for them to contact you for work, also very premature. Uh, so the or way we'll to do never, it, Or will never mature. <laughs> right, ever. right, right. Both, yeah, neither one of those is really going to happen on their own. So what it means is uh, I, I'm interested in you enough to want to hear back from you. And so what I, how I view that is... Um, Don't email them every day, (laughs) but as you complete, I I would say probably every six weeks or so is a great time frame to send them an image. Hey, here's something I'm working on. Just thought you might be interested. I hope you're doing well. Um, And especially if you have ideas that go along with that kind of an image, was thinking of turning this into a story. Here's a brief synopsis. Uh, You know, hope you're doing well. See you later. You don't even have to ask for their feedback or or return anything. uh, Yeah, nothing. You're not asking them for anything. You are literally just sending them updates as it goes. And then pretty soon, you know, you've sent them quite a bit of updates. They start to know your work. And then maybe that that there is that reciprocal kind of relationship that starts to happen. They could ask for a specific image or do you want to, you know, collaborate on this or do you want to submit for this or whatever. Um, But that's the way that I view that kind of a thing. Let's keep in touch. Uh, What do you think? Yeah, I think I think you summed it up really, really, really well. Uh, as an old school executive recruiter, the uh, one of the key things to determine if if a candidate was a really good for for a role or not a role was their level of communication. Some people overdid it way too much, and it was like, whoa, boy, this feels like <laughs> settle down. <laughs> yeah, settle down. Too much, <laughs> too quick. It's all the time. Like it's just it. it you just know it, and it felt desperate. Um, and then other people would just sort of sit back and then they fall, they fall out of your, your mind's eye and you just never think about them ever again. Um, I think a lot about what makes a person feel special. So, and a lot of times, you know, and this is, we use the word ego and it's not, not in a negative way, but we all have an ego. And if somebody 
comes back comes back to me and says, I really like your work or this particular image stood out or I was on your live stream the other day and you were talking with uh, talking about your son in first grade. That little connective tissue makes me more interested to have some kind of communication with them. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that, that, that I do and I would suggest doing is that those art directors probably have Instagrams or LinkedIn's uh, or professional articles that they've written or maybe books that they've helped uh, edit uh, that really stand out to you. You can incorporate what you can find out about them in their, their real world that they put out on the internet uh, as little little bits, little bits to, to grab their attention. Like what's an example help. of that? Like in the email you say, I saw that article you wrote for communication arts and loved what you had to say about this or that. And here's what stood out to me. So here, so here's a real example of this. So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I wanted to take control of my career a little bit more and not wait for my agent to come back and say, here's an opportunity because, you know, I'm kind of a relatively unknown. And so I started on Instagram, uh, just looking up art directors, uh, 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 editors at various publishing houses and just following their Instagrams. And then when something really stood out to me, I would just direct message them and say, I really like that post. And I'm not doing it to get a job out of it. I'm, what I'm doing is I'm really wanting to speak directly to the person, but in a really cool, casual way. Like, I, I, I don't anticipate getting anything out of the deal. It's just to be a good human. Um, and struck up a bunch of different conversations. Uh, some of the, one of those conversations in particular, really, you know, every week or two, we would have some sort of really informal interaction that either I would engage on or that person would engage on. And then three months in, four months in, that person offered me a really awesome opportunity. Uh, I didn't I didn't ask for it. Uh, I didn't go in thinking that that would be the end result. Uh, I just wanted to, to meet other people who do things that I think are really cool. And um, it turns out that level of communication, just saying, I really like that post the other day. Um, and it's more than just double tapping the screen and hearting a post. Like no one, no one cares. Right. Uh, but a direct message in the DMs, in the inbox, um, that points out an aspect of something that is important to them or they like, I think it just opens a door. But you don't do that every day. <laughs> every I just sent you a message on Instagram situation. saying I like. Never going to look at it. Never going to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I am four thousand messages behind on my DMs, so I'm never going to look at it. Yeah. I concur with you guys. I'll just add one little thing. I I like to try to incorporate some kind of personal note about just whatever feels natural based on the situation. It might be about, you know, the publication or the company they work for and the work that they've put out. Um, it, but something where they get a little window into my life, what's going on, um, and that's that's a little tricky to to you know because you're trying to send a professional letter. But here's the thing, humans have this flaw, and and that is that humans like to give jobs to people they know, or they feel like or they're rooting for or people that right. they feel like or, or that are like more, them. Yeah, that have a connection to even if it's little, it, it, it can give you an edge. And, and yeah, like Anthony, you know, you're saying like I'm trying to be a good human and just um, you know just being personable and stuff and and that's yeah that's that's what you that's what we all want to be right is that good person that who is genuinely caring and you know we're not just making a comment to get a job but at the same time you are I mean well, you're in well, it to try to not, get work. smart about not it being so optimistic I mean being genuinely interested in people changes how they treat you you can right. tell when somebody's fishing for a job or being, right. uh, you know, patronizing almost in, in a way. Okay, let me just, this, this is a sort of non sequitur, but it kind of goes with, along with this right before the podcast. I was, so I've talked about my new rental condo <laughs> that I've been doing for a while. I've been working on it forever and it's now live on Airbnb. How come so the friends no, and family discount is double the normal rate? How, how come <laughs> only the rate? Gonna rent that's, the Anth that's the Anthony rate. We already podcast. have like four rentals already. It just went live two days ago. We have no, four. But I mean from Welcome to Rental Talk. with. Uh, <laughs> 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 I'll put my link in the, in the Airbnb. If anybody wants to stay at my, <laughs> no, this is not an ad for that. But here's what happened this morning. I got a booking. Um, and, uh, the guy wrote, um, just a simple kind of question. Oh, he says, how much is the parking per night? 
that was the only question that he started with. And so we started, I sent him this thing saying, Hey, the parking is this, but you don't even need a car. You can do this, 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 and this try just try. I'm trying to be helpful to him. Um, and that started us kind of chatting. He says, eventually, after just going back and forth, we were looking uh, to do, start a little side business in Breckenridge, hoping I'm going to be back a bunch. And I said, that sounds great. What kind of business are you starting? And so we start down this conversation that I had no intention of, you know, he just asked about the parking. That's, it. But now we're having this whole conversation. He was an instructor at Vail teaching skiing and snowboarding. Um, and I said, you know, I was a uh, competitive skateboarder forever and been snowboarding forever, but my son is interested in that. So then we started about him possibly, uh, teaching my son. And then by the end of it, and I said, by the way, the, a lot of people have a need for that. I will list your services within the Airbnb listing. If people are looking for somebody to, to, um, uh, to teach them how to ski or snowboard. And again, that was just, uh, I wasn't fishing for anything. It was just us. It was a natural extension of this conversation. And he said, and then he sends me a link to his snowboard instruction website. And he said, I'm going to put your condo on my website. That was, I mean, that started with a, how much is the parking? Yeah. And all good of a sudden humans, we have this, human. Like, yeah, look at we, that. Yeah. reciprocal kind of thing. And so it's just a, just sort of an analogy for how you can interact with an art director or an art buyer or something. Um, and you just got to watch. I, uh, the reason I say this is because I've been to a lot of SCBWI conferences and the amount of people hoping to shove an image in front of an art director or an editor <laughs> and wanting them to say, oh my God, I've never seen anything like this. I'm going to hire you. It doesn't work like that. It, you really want to back off, just be person. The whole goal is to make re- connections and relationships, not get a job. Um, and then that's how it evolves sort of naturally. So I ho- hope that makes sense. Yeah. I, mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think there, I, I, I just don't think people think enough about the human element of all of this. You can be smart, thoughtful, and strategic at the same time. I mean, ultimately, I'm not, I'm not reaching out on Instagram complimenting everybody because uh, I have four extra hours in my day, you know, there's, <laughs> right. but you can be smart, thoughtful, and strategic about things. And in some things are going to come quick. Some things are going to uh, come much later down the road and some things are never going to turn out. I just don't think that that, that, that goodwill, uh, that humanistic goodwill, uh, even if it, nothing ever turns out or whatever, just, it, it can't be a bad thing. It just can't. Right. And then yeah. and that defines us going back to the first question we had. That's the difference between us and this AI content. Yep. Is that we're humans Bingo. dealing with humans. <laughs> yeah. And people want it. People want that connection um, to your work it, and personally too. It was interesting. It, 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 just thinking about that. And I was, I was rereading that, uh, that first question, you know, talking about the saturated market and the products and things like that. Uh, somebody reached out to me a while back on Instagram and, um, and said, I'm making a I'm making a comic book. It's based on this, this, and this. I saw in your profile that you do this, this, and this. I just thought you might want to check it out. And it was a very tailored, specific message to me. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't uh, just a blast or whatever. This person took the time. I sure as heck checked that thing out. I didn't end up buying it or supporting it, um, but I was really impressed with that level of interaction. That's how that's how you create some fans, though. That's how you get people in your corner. And I might not have any interest in this particular thing, but I'm sure interested with the with the next thing is this guy puts out uh, that might be exactly what I'm ready to buy or support. You know. Yep. Good stuff. Good stuff. Cool. Will you got anything to add? Will's kind of a robot, so he doesn't really care. Well, he's yeah. He's, very, <laughs> he's the AI. He's been replaced. <laughs> that's right. There is no Will Terry. Will uh, is playing pickleball right now. He's not even. He's not even here. I, I, Last, in my mind, I'm like, I want to try this new shot. Yeah. <laughs> Last time I was on the episode and uh, and Lee was gone, Will was drawing the whole time or helping to further uh, my propaganda that you're a time traveler based on that photo that you've shared with me previously, mm-hmm. Lee. So, Will Will really <laughs> oh really the time traveler. That's I've been right. doodling. <laughs> Squares, little squares and balls, and then turn them into something. <laughs> it always comes back to a triangle, a square, and a circle. Yeah. Um, your squares right. and balls. <laughs> Here we go. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Wait, do we have anything else to add before I outro us? It's been a good episode, guys. Do you, do you think yeah, you can one nice. and done this outro? It's oh, oh yeah. dude, I can easily one and uh, done it. Know. Here we go. Three, two. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by svslearn.com, where becoming a great illustrator starts. Your hosts have been Will Terry. He's at 
willterry.com and Instagram at willterryart on YouTube. Is that also your Instagram? It's written kind of weird. Um, I'm at Lee. I'm Lee White, and I'm at LeeWhiteIllustration.com. My Instagram is Lee White Illo. And Anthony Wheeler, what's your what's your what's your your handles? Your your <laughs> what's your damage? What's your what's function? What's, what's, what's your, your phone number? Accounts. What do we? What's do? your what's blood your? type? <laughs> uh, it's Anthony Wheeler Art on Instagram, Twitch, Facebook. Uh, pickleballonly.com. Yeah, you can you can get all that stuff at Anthony Wheeler. What's your pin number? <laughs> 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 all right. Podcast produced by Daniel Tu. That's Daniel T U. Um, special thanks to the keeper of the curriculum, that is Austin Sherliff. A show notes wrangler is Lily Howell, and our chief operations officer is Lisa Fott. They keep everything running, keep the lights on here at SVS. All right, now go draw something. Yay! Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> How have you guys been? Horrible. Been awful. awful. <laughs> I've always wanted to say horrible. I haven't been. But you're you haven't been to horrible? Say, is it all the warts on your feet? Is that what's still acting It up? is. Feet warts. I've got most of them. <laughs> um, we started using uh, pliers to just pinch them off. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, <laughs> No, but you know how you socially. Welcome back to Wart Talk with Will Terry. (laughs) You're supposed to, you're supposed to say good. Like when when someone casually meets you, your friend or something, and you know it's a high buy situation. Yeah. They don't really want you to tell them all your problems. They want you to say, "Oh, everything's great," so that you can just continue on your way. Yeah. But you're only full of problems now, so you just want to tell people about your problems. No, actually, I'm not. But. I just thought I'd experiment with you and just say horrible. But yeah. you are good because I'm I'm getting emails from you. Hey guys, for the next 24 hours, I'm going to be doodling in my book. If you order a book, you get a doodle, right? I'm part of your email efforts. I see. That's you. right. How's that? How's that going? Is that is that it's paying going off? good? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I woke up to the inbox full of because I I set the the next the final email for. 8 a.m. Eastern time, which is 5 a.m. here. So when I woke up, I saw like, order, 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 order. Order in the court. I like it. Yeah. Look at you. I all like grown it a up. lot. Yeah. <laughs> I've, been, I've been terrible. I, I want to do. I want to do artwork again. Sometimes in life, though, you deviate for a little bit, and you have to yeah. just finish it up. I got no choice but to finish this path that I'm on, to finish this dumb remodel that I did. Well, and, and I'm the only one doing it. So, well, you've been in jail for the last 45 days, though. I have. A, when I mean condo, that means <laughs> quote, unquote, it's jail. That means the, mount, jail. the mountain jail from, from pr- past transgressions. <laughs> now, we won't talk about No, no, no. It's funny, that, it's funny that you say that because that's the only time I have been in jail. I know. Is Breckenridge. I don't know if we did it, if we talked about that before, but yeah. I... Uh, I know the town well. The sheriff, Every time me and the sheriff walk by each other, it's a knowing kind of wink and a nod. That guy but, twirls um, his mustache, <laughs> and spits on the ground and says, you again. So out of the three of us, Anthony's the only one that's been to prison. Uh, I wouldn't call it prison. Uh, just I mean, bars. if it's opened air, is it prison at that point? Okay, just chipping rocks away. Have you been in jail for real? I've never been in jail. I've been arrested, but then I got unarrested very quickly. That sounds like really? a good story. I, the, the, the TLDR is I went to a baseball game like 15, 20 years ago uh, with a bunch of friends. Uh, I had right. one adult beverage, just seriously one, no exaggeration. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got, uh, mm-hmm. as I pulled out of the baseball game in my car, and that, that had happened maybe at 5 p.m., and the game was over at 1030. Uh, I pulled into what was a DOI checkpoint. And when they rolled down the window, earlier that day, I was at Safeway, which is a grocery store, and they had boxes of junior <laughs> mints. Like, I was, a ch- I was a chubby, I was really chubby 20 years ago. And so I bought like four or five boxes of junior mints, and I was just eating junior mints as the police officer rapped on my door. And then, and then he's like, sir, have you been drinking? I was like, I had a beer on like five hours ago. And then uh, he saw me <laughs> eating the junior mints and thought thought that I was trying to cover something up. And so they uh, did, like, asked a bunch of questions, pulled me out of the car, read me my rights, uh, mm-hmm. had me do the, do the field sobriety test. 
And uh, and I failed all of them because by that point I was just scared. I've never been in trouble. I don't even have a speeding ticket. I've never been well, arrested. Well, I mean, for I can sympathize because when they say, "Oh, do the alphabet backwards," I can't do that. If Impossible. you ask me to do that, there is no way I could do that. Yeah, right now. yeah. And we had to stand to do all these uh, sobriety tests. We had to stand on top of this like uh, this this big bridge in town where the wind is just whipping back and forth. And as you're doing the test, everyone is honking their horn. And so you just have performance anxiety as you're standing <laughs> on one leg, tapping your head, rubbing your belly and saying the alphabet backwards. So they, they full blown arrested me and they put me in the paddy wagon and there's this guy next to me in the paddy wagon. And he's like yelling profanities about police officers and saying all of the, all of the, the stuff. And I was like, stop it. I was like, I'm not, I'm not going down for you. I'm not part of your That's constituency. So funny. At well, all. I, at all. And then I had to blow into the magic machine to tell them what my blood alcohol level was. And your I, well, mint here's level my question. Was. Why, why don't they start with the, with the breathalyzer? I don't understand I, why you I do offered, the dancing first. I offered and I said, just I'll blow into the machine. I have, I have nothing to hide. And uh, no, so I, an hour and a half later, going through that whole thing. Uh, they did, they do that on purpose, I think, just to just to entertain oh, themselves. Yeah. Well, and there then they're was like, the oh, yeah, lines it's of I'm telling you, this was the biggest oh, thing I've ever wow. seen. I blew double zeros like multiple times, and they all sat and stared at me, and were like, they're like, what in the world? And I was like, I was just really nervous that just I was going to fail all the tests. And then they yeah, let I me mean, go. That should, that should make sense mm-hmm. because, I mean, if you go to a doctor's office, what is it, white coat syndrome where you're, yeah, you, you go to a doctor's do. office, your blood pressure goes up, and that's just a private meeting with your doctor. Can you, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you're in like this public display of idiotness. Yeah. <laughs> I saw so, so many people get arrested and for real get taken to jail. And by the end of two hours, the whole thing, I just sort of got back in my car and I'm sweating. I'm like a key and peel, peel skit. Like I'm just sweating. <laughs> and then I drive home and my wife is like, where have you been? And I was like, oh, baby, I got a story for you. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and, she, and she bought it, huh? She did. Yeah, she did. She did. Hook, line, and sinker. Yeah. 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 Well, just this to clarify, for those of people who didn't hear the other episode, if I explained it, I was arrested for... Walking up the mountain at Breckenridge, strangely enough, where I now own property, and, uh, <laughs> and trying to get on the lift without paying when I was like 20, 21 years old. I had no money. And uh, they let me walk all the way. It is, if you've ever tried to walk <laughs> up stairs at high elevation, it's hard. Now try to walk through snow uphill right. with yeah. all your gear. And I get halfway up the mountain to the next lift, and I'm like, ah, I got one over on them. And then when I got to the top of the lift, there was a snowmobile waiting with police and they handcuffed me and drove me down the mountain uh, and put me in jail for the day. <laughs> did you say your your parents just let you be in there? Yeah, they did. They let me stay. They said, you got yourself in, you get yourself out. It was quite a, quite a day. So it was not a big deal. I did not commit a real crime or anything like that <laughs> except for snowboarding. Um, you know, as a teenager yeah, but or you're a young adult. The way you snowboard is kind of a crime. <laughs> it is. It's criminal. <laughs> it is. I'm, too, I'm too fast. I'm speeding. Thank you, Will Terry, for that compliment. <laughs> All right, That's let's amazing. go ahead and dive into it. Enough jail talk. We could go on for days. <laughs> do we want to do intros and outros, or do we just want this to be the... No, no, no. The... I'm going to do the intro. I've got the stuff. All right, do you want me to play the, play the part of Jake so you You're... guys can play the part of Lee and Will? No, no, no. You're, I'm Jake today. You're Lee. <clears throat> Will's Will. I've already, I've been Lee twice now. You have been? Well, see, I've, now I've you're Jake. Su- now I've, you're Jake. I've subbed for you maybe three times now at this yeah, point. Yeah, I think more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People are actually asking for me to leave. At some point, we're just going to write a script, and it's just, I don't have to sub, sub for anybody. It's just me. Yeah. No, it's going to take a while. You're going to do <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's go ahead into this thing. Okay. So... Instead of the, you're the second man, so when okay. after I say I'm Lee White, you that you're Anthony Wheeler, and then Will Terry, um, and then you don't have to say anything else. I'll I'll do the rest. Um, Will you this do is your go, this? Is going to go horribly. Oh, it's going to be. A disaster. <laughs> I can do Here the I can do the Lee part. It's not a problem. I have it in front of it? me. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Let's do that. Do so you not know watch it? the episodes where you're gone and I'm here? No, I don't watch any episode oh. ever. Oh, we mock you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't doubt that. <laughs> Last time we talked about how you're a time traveler. <laughs> it's true. Um, all right. We're stepping into the future right now. Here we go. Pretty good. We did it. I forgot to say special thank you to Anthony Wheeler for joining us, but you're, you're kind of a regular now. People thank don't care you. About yeah. you. I'm, like the, I'm like the Joan Rivers of the Tonight Show. <laughs> Just whenever Johnny couldn't be around, Joan was on. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You are the... You are the yeah. 
what's the um <laughs> what's the chick i'm totally blanking on her name but you're like the punky brewster to wheel of fortune um <laughs> okay <laughs> Salil Moonfry Moonfry is Punky Brewster uh, was she on Wheel of Fortune uh, yeah 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 um, hold on let me Wheel of Fortune <laughs> my uh, I'm going to the comments for the last episode that I was on so first of all it, uh, somebody pointed out on the episode that I was last on uh it was, it was you weren't here, Lee, but you're the face on the thumbnail, which just was really funny. Oh, like that's what, awesome! What, that's what a classic bait and switch. Um, but my favorite, <laughs> they, they know who gets the clicks. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Oh no, it's Jeopardy! 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 The host of Jeopardy is Punky. Al- it was Alec Trebek, but now it's Mayim Bialik. Oh, so you're talking? Okay. Isn't that Punky Brewster? No. Whatever. Um, my favorite comment, though, <laughs> from the last episode was on was from my friend Dan Diemer and said, man, having Anthony Wheeler Hart on Three Point Perspective is like throwing a bag of bees into the DMV, and I'm here for it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means, but is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a good know. thing. It That's a good thing. on how Did, you look at it. The oh, wait, are, we, are we the DMV? Is that what he's You're the DMV, saying? and yeah. I'm the bag of bees. Like, it's just chaos. It's just chaos. It's a little bit louder. There's nothing the, monotone the about bees, anything. Are the bees dead? Hmm. The bag of no! bees? No! Are they Africanized? Oh, how do you know? bees? What kind of bees? But how do you know that they're not dead? What if these are trained zoo bees? Yeah. Dan is not an awful person. He knows that the pollinators are all that survive in this world. Okay? <laughs> so he knows that I'll be buzzing around the DMV of SVS Learn. Maybe they were murder hornets. <laughs> Murder. Well, if it, if it was like that, then I wouldn't be asked back, would I? I wouldn't we be the optional about, fill-in host. We were talking about murder hornets the other day. Did you guys ever see the YouTube guy who just lets bees and yeah. wasps and spiders sting him, and then he's like, yep. ow, ow, ow. <laughs> yeah, and he's like, this is the worst pain I've ever felt in my life, and the, the, all he does is talks about it. It's great. Yeah, those bullet ants. I can't believe we watched it. But the funny thing is, if you look at the, uh, I mean, I guess a lot of shows are like that, but it's the same thing. It doesn't matter whether it's like a little honeybee or the, the murder hornet. It's all the same reaction. Ow, have you, ow. Ever se- have you ever seen how they use ant heads as sutures in some uh, third world countries? I have. Yeah. No, have you ever seen that, Anthony? That's what we do no. here. So that's they, they, they introduce the ant to the, to the cut, right? Yeah. And it's a big head ant and a big head and it's got those pinchers whatever and as soon as it touches both sides of a cut it clamps down and then they break the head off and it stays clamped in there and they just do that a bunch of times and with different ants so you got head like ten sutures ants? yeah ant i'm gonna start offering sutures. that as a gourmet option here in uh Highlands Ranch for the rich moms. <laughs> Yo, those Highland Ranch moms are not eating dead ant heads. I'm telling you right now. I'm telling you right now. No, I'm but hell, you got to, it depends on how you sell it. It depends on how you sell it. It's how clever. Like, it's just like it's just like people Ingenuity. putting a hot hot rock on your back. Who yeah. would have ever thought people would pay for a hot rock to be set on them? Yeah. Yeah. But they who, do. who would people, think that anybody would ever listen to this this show? 180 people. versions of this show. Who would ever think that <laughs> anyone is still listening to this show? If, if you're, you're still, still <laughs> listening to the show right now and this makes it to the show notes, let's put, put, a, put an uh, ant. ant. Let's put an ant. ant. <laughs> put an ant in there. That's a, that's a random fact. I had no idea. Did you liken this episode to being bit by a bullet ant? Kind and then bit. sutured with the same ant head. Same ant. <laughs> but it, <laughs> it's just thing. excruciating pain the entire time. It, it like, hurts. thank you for saving my life, but this hurts so bad. It hurts and heals. Just like just like <laughs> That's the name of my store, podcast. Hurts and Heals. <laughs> just like your touch. Gourmet like spa touch. for Highlands Ranch moms. <laughs> Too much money. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if we have any listeners from Highlands Ranch. <laughs> I don't just know. One. Just oh, one. no, I, I know we do. There, there's, there's one person who told uh, who I met who said it's taken okay, some of your my wife classes, doesn't count. So. Okay. Oh, your no, wife doesn't mind. count. There's nobody there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me let you fools go. My mom is here. We're going to go day. shopping. 